Well, good morning, church. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, is it not? Man, some great worship. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, worship team. Man, we are glad you are here this morning at Shades. If it's your first time with us or you're joining us online, we're glad that you're here to lift up the name of Jesus with us. That's what we're about as a church, is to lift up the name of Jesus because we believe that he has made a way for us to walk with the living God, and we want to serve him and give our lives to him. And man, that's, that's the DNA of who we are here at Shades. So we're glad to have you here this morning. And if you have been with us or you haven't been with us, we do want you to know that we've been in a series in the last seven weeks looking at the I am statements of Jesus. And these I am statements are recorded for us in the book of John by the Apostle John. And we're getting to the very last of those statements this morning in John chapter 15. And so even though you just sat down, we're gonna do one more squat. I'm gonna ask you to stand up with me this morning. Go ahead and stand and open your Bibles to John chapter 15. Here at Shades, we stand at the reading of the word of God. We believe that God's word is the revelation, the way that God reveals himself to us, that when we look at the word of God, we are seeing what God has told us about himself and how we are to interact and have relationship and know him. And so we believe that when we stand at the reading of the word of God, we are showing reverence because it is the foundation for the people of God. It is right and good and true that as the grass withers and the flower fades, God's word abides forever. And so we stand at its reading, submitting to what it has to tell us about the living God we are here to worship. So look with me this morning, John chapter 15, beginning in verse one, and we're gonna read through verse 11 together this morning. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, You can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, So I have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we recognize this morning that anytime Jesus says, I am, I am, he is making a claim about himself that is impossible to ignore, a claim about who he really is, that he is God in the flesh that has come to the earth to save us through his life, death, and resurrection. So God, we recognize that in Jesus' statement, I am the true vine. He's telling us something eternal, something specific, something unique, something life-changing about who he is and how he has come for us. So God, I pray that you would show us this morning, that you would soften our hearts to the reality of what Jesus seeks to communicate by claiming to be the true vine. We submit to your word and your will in us today. Work in us in a new and fresh way. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all can be seated this morning. Man, there is nothing quite like holding your first child in your arms for the very first time. Little did I know between when Anna became pregnant with Abe and when Abe would actually come, there was a laundry list of things that had to happen for us to get ready for his arrival. All right, so we're gonna walk through a little bit of these, okay, this morning. First, there's the nursery. You gotta choose the colors. You gotta order the crib. You gotta test the gliders in all the different stores and all all across the city. You gotta get the changing table and assemble it. You gotta get the room situated and get everything in the right place. And then there's the clothes, right? Lots and lots and lots of clothes. Thank you, grandparents, very much for all of the clothes, right? 
And you take the clothes and you wash the clothes and you fold the clothes and then you put them in the drawer literally for the only time they will ever be in that drawer, right? Because once you wear them and use them again and you're up all night, washing clothes, is uh, that's a funny thing to talk about, right? Then there's burp cloths and wipes and diapers and you gotta get the car seats in the car. There's all kinds of different things. People give you toys even though your baby can't use the toys until like six months after they're born and you're like, what do I do with these toys, Right? You get all these things together, you get them in their right place, and then that's just the physical preparation that has to happen for the arrival of a child. Then there's all the mental preparations that have to happen. The conversations with grandparents and well-wishers full of advice of all different kinds on how to discipline your kids and what kind of formula you should use and how you can schedule their sleep and be baby-wise, right? And read all of the right books so that you know exactly what you're doing when they come. And then there's the medical preparations that have to go in. You meet with doctors, you meet with nurses, you have ultrasounds, you check the baby's health, you check the mother's health, you talk about that day and what it's gonna be like when that child comes and what that process will be like. And you do all of these things, all of these preparations just to get ready for that baby to come. And then, and then the doctor walks over to you and you hear this crying sound. And in his hands is this tiny little baby And he goes, here's your son. And in one moment, you realize that all of those preparations, no matter how important they were, no matter how necessary they're going to be, all of those preparations could in no way prepare you for that moment. It was in that moment that I felt so incredibly blessed and so unbelievably overwhelmed at the same time. So ready for what God had given me and so totally ill-equipped to raise this little son that he had given me. I was full of anxiety and full of joy. It was the craziest kind of oxymoron of a moment I have ever experienced in my life. And never at another time had I felt so prepared and so incredibly out of my depth in the very same breath. And I know some of you in the room this morning, you haven't had a child, but we've all been in a place at some point or another in our lives when we have prepared for something when we thought we understood what we had signed up for, when we were all in and we were like, man, I'm ready to go. And then we got into that moment and we realized, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm anxious. I don't know what the next right move is to take. And this is the moment I really believe we find the disciples in, in John chapter 15. You see, Jesus had walked with them. They had given their lives to Jesus. They had left everything behind to follow him. And now Jesus' tone began to change. In fact, the, the chapters leading up to chapter 15 of John, we see that Jesus talks more and more and more about his death, more and more and more about his departure. And we know from the scene that Pastor George set for us last week on Easter Sunday that Jesus' ministry was coming to a climax And the disciples felt it. They felt it. They were worried. In fact, the scripture tells us that their hearts were troubled. And as Jesus is trying to teach them and prepare them and get them ready for him to leave and and finally go and do the thing that he had said he would go to do, his disciples' hearts were troubled at the end of their time with Jesus. They thought their life with Jesus was coming to an end. And Jesus could see it, which I love I love that Jesus could see his disciples. He could see their hearts. And it's at the end of of chapter 14 that we see Jesus say, come, let us go from here. The the Jeremy Horton translation of that has, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. I know you guys are worried. I know you don't understand. I know you thought you knew what you had signed up for and things, man, they're just feeling to, they're feeling like they're picking up speed and they're getting out of control. Let's just go for a walk. And it's while he's on this walk with his disciples that Jesus says the words, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. You see, I believe Jesus seeks to show us in his claim as the true vine, as he was showing the disciples, that his death wasn't the end of life, but the beginning. That when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he is telling us something critical about understanding why he had to die and what his death and resurrection would mean for us. In fact, I think he tells us about the kind of life that he would make available to us through his death. And I think there are three distinctives 
that Jesus gives us in this imagery of that life. And these are the three things I want us to, to camp on this morning together. The first is this, that through the death of Jesus, through the death of Jesus, true life will come, true life. Jesus begins his teaching to the disciples in John 15 by making a very exclusive statement about himself, a very kind of qualified statement about himself. He says, I am the true vine. The vines that likely littered the area where they walked gave physical representation to Jesus' teaching. But Jesus wasn't just trying to make a good object lesson about vines. In fact, there's a very significant meaning in the statement, I am the true vine. In fact, for us to understand just how profound Jesus' claim is in John 15, we have to understand that there was a failed vine. A failed vine that came before the true vine. Vine. Now, vine imagery is occasionally used in the Old Testament as a means of describing God's choosing of Israel as his people. And if you're newer to Bible study this morning, Israel is the nation that God had chose in the Old Testament to worship him, to know him, and to be a representation of him and his holiness to the world. But if you read the Old Testament really anywhere, if you read the Old Testament at any period of time, you'll see that Israel constantly fell short of God's requirements for them to be in relationship with him. And it was in times when Israel had fallen short, when they were living contrary to God's law, that God would send people called prophets to warn them to turn back to himself, to give them a warning that they were headed in the wrong direction. And it's in one of these moments that we see the prophet Isaiah use the imagery of planting a vineyard as a means of describing God's relationship with his people and the sinful place they found themselves in. It'll be on the screen this morning, but look with me at Isaiah chapter five. Isaiah says this, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When, it looked, when I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? We see clearly in Isaiah 5 that God had done everything necessary to plant Israel as a vineyard that would flourish and bear fruit. But instead, the Bible tells us it only bore wild grapes. The imagery here is meant to show us that although God had given Israel everything it needed to worship him rightly, they knew exactly what they had to do to worship God rightly, but they just couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. Their good works weren't enough to please God. Their hearts constantly went after other affections and other things that pulled them away and their lives bore no fruit. They were in essence a failed vine. When we contrast this imagery in Isaiah with the statement made by Jesus in verse one of John 15, we begin to understand just how significant it was that Jesus would claim to be the true vine. In this verse, Jesus is claiming to be the new channel of life between God and man. In the same way that the law of God was meant to make relationship possible between Israel and God, here we see that through Jesus, God initiates a new way of entering into relationship with him. And unlike the law, which only magnifies our inability to know God by our works and by what we do through Jesus, we are invited to experience life, true life with God by grace through faith. When Jesus claims to be the true vine, he makes it clear that the saving work of God comes no longer through the law, but through faith in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. We saw this in the I am statement we looked at together last week in John 14. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's exclusive. There's one way. There's only one way that we can enter into relationship with our father. But we know in our culture today, just as Pastor George pointed out last week, it's a very intolerant way of thinking in today's day and age. It may even seem arrogant for us to say there's only one way to God. 
And the culture tells us that not only is there there's multiple ways and there's multiple different things we can run after in our lives, but if we run after those things, we're gonna, we can find life in those things. We can find life that, that gives us purpose, gives us meaning, gives us satisfaction. If we just run after the desires of our hearts, then we'll find what we're looking for. But Jesus tells us something totally different here. Jesus' claim is the true vine reminds us that true life begins for us only when our greatest need is first addressed. You see, our pursuit for satisfaction and fulfillment and purpose, true life and so many other things is actually only a symptom of the sin that has separated us from the life that you were made, created to experience with God himself. That true life, life that would satisfy you, that would give you purpose, that would give you meaning, that would fulfill your heart's most deep longings, it can only be found in the true life that Jesus makes available to us in God. You see, Jesus' claim as the true vine is exclusive, not just in the sense that it's the only way to God, but in the sense that it is the only life that we were made to live with God. That it is the life that you were created to know, to find joy in. It's the life that you were created to worship from. This is exactly what Jesus does on our behalf as the true vine. He makes a way for us to experience true life. Not false life, not not false promises of life, but true life in him. What we were always made to experience. Jesus makes it clear that the dead can only find life when the one who brings life goes to death. That the dead can only find life when the one who can bring life to us will confront and face death on our behalf. And it is then that he invites us into the life we were made to live, life with God, life in relationship with the one who made us in his image to walk with him. Dane Ortland says this about the life that, that Jesus invites us into as the true life. He says, you were made for God. The heart of Christianity is not a set of doctrines to believe, even though sound doctrine is vital, nor is the heart of Christianity an activity to pursue, even though the Christian faith is necessarily active, nor is it essentially a a set of disciplines, even though without reading the Bible or praying, we won't get far in the Christian life. No, the heart of Christianity is, to use a phrase from John Bunyan, the old Puritan preacher and writer, the heart of Christianity is, listen to this, to live upon God. You were made for God, to know him, enjoy him, revere him, draw strength from him, trust him, love him. The life that you were made for is the life that the true vine invites you into. The true life offered in Jesus is the only answer to the longing of your heart for satisfaction, for fulfillment, for purpose, for meaning. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and it is through my death that you enter into the life you've always longed for. Do you know that life this morning? Do you know that life? The life you were created to live in relationship with God. What things are you looking for satisfaction and fulfillment in? Only in the true vine will you find what you're looking for. Do you know him? Jesus' statement, I am the true vine, sets the table for us in entering into relationship with God. But he doesn't stop there. As he continues on with this imagery of the vine and the branches, we see that Jesus also offers us changed life, not just true life, but changed life. As Jesus is walking with his disciples through the streets of Jerusalem, he explains to them that his death wouldn't be the end of their life with him, but the beginning. Continuing with this language of branches and vines, Jesus describes to his disciples the intimate, vibrant, and life-changing communion they would experience with him after he had gone to death and rose from the dead. And Jesus does this in verse four through the language of abiding. The word abide is used 15 times in the original language in this passage. It is absolutely critical for us to understand what it really means to really understand how Jesus brings about life change to us through the true life he offers. The word abide literally means to remain or to stay. And Jesus' instructions for his disciples were to remain in him and he would remain in them. 
But when we think about Jesus's command in verse four, it really doesn't make any sense. Jesus says, hey, remain in me. I'm just gonna go. Just stay in me while I go away. And the disciples are like, you're here now. You're with us like right now in this place. Why are you telling us to remain in you while you're saying you're going to leave? We've been with you for three years. We've walked life with you. We've left everything behind to follow you. Why can't you just stay? And Jesus says, no, you need to abide. You need to abide in me. For us to really understand the command to abide, we have to zoom out of this conversation a little bit because this is actually just a small little snippet of a much larger conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples at the very end of his ministry. In fact, John 13 through 17 records for us what's called the last discourse. It's the last conversation between Jesus and his disciples as he readies them for his departure. And when we look closer at this conversation, we see that interwoven into the fabric of of this conversation, Jesus promises something that is critical for our understanding in his command to abide. He promises to send us the Holy Spirit. He promises to send us the Holy Spirit. In fact, in John 16, seven through eight, Jesus goes so far as to say that the sending of the Holy Spirit was going to be better for his disciples than his physical presence with them. I wanna look at this, these verses really quickly with you. Jesus says this in John 16, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, it's the promise of the Holy Spirit that clarifies Jesus's command to abide in him and shows us the way to life change in Jesus. We see in John 16, after his death, Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit living in us as we live by faith in Jesus functions for us as a helper. The word is literally the helper. Jesus helps us by helping us to to see the truth. The Holy Spirit tells us that we, it, it reveals to us our sin and the places we need to repent. It directs us to the will of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit is given to every believer and it is the power needed for genuine life change to happen. And Jesus gives some language to this when he talks about vines and branches bearing fruit in John 15, five through eight. We see here this kind of back and forth that happens in the text. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you're gonna bear fruit. If you don't abide in me, you won't bear anything. If you abide in me, then you'll have access to the Father. You can pray, you can ask God for whatever you need and he will give it to you so that you might bear fruit. But if you're not in me, you won't do anything at all. Here we see there's a vital connection between ongoing faith in Jesus, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the bearing of fruit in the life of every believer. Jesus makes it abundantly clear that when we actively believe in him, the spirit convicts and leads our hearts and brings about change in us to want what God wants, to turn away from the things that God does not want or does not command for us to follow in our lives and to run after the mission that God has in the world. This is the changed life that Jesus secures for us as the true vine. But you're like, okay, that's a lot of theology, that's a lot of kind of big idea pictures. What are you really saying? What are you really saying? What are you getting at? I think it's critical for us to understand that Jesus is saying that it is vital for you to have uninterrupted connection to the vine if you are gonna bear fruit. Uninterrupted connection to the vine. It's absolutely necessary that our spiritual connection to Jesus is an every day, every moment, by faith, trust in what he has made available to us as the true life. I want you to think about it like this. You guys remember those big, giant, six-disc CD players? You know what I'm talking about? Where they had like a speaker on one side and a speaker on the other, and they had all those weird red like cords running underneath, and then that massive like bass thing in the middle, right? And it had the disc changer, and you would press the button, and it would be like you know, and like make all that noise. You could put six discs in there at a time. And hey, the sound was pretty good, right? 
You could turn it up. You could crank it up a little bit. You want to do a dance party while you're washing dishes. I know that's specific. I may have done that a few times. You can do it if you want to, right? You can totally do it. And you turn it up really loudly. But there is one caveat to that CD player. And that was that, man, it had to be plugged into the wall, right? If it wasn't plugged into the wall, then it wasn't going to play music. And there were a few times I'm like doing the dishes or whatever, maybe jamming out a little bit. I don't know. All right. And one of my brothers like thinks it's a joke, right? And he's like, <laughs> pulls it out of the wall. And what happens? Well, the music stops, right? Because the power for that CD player to play that music is coming from the wall. But you and I, man, we live in a really different reality today, right? We've got this little square in our pockets, all right? This thing has access to any kind of music anytime you want to. And the most beautiful part about it is you just charge it up once, twice a week, and it's there. It's always ready to go, right? You pull it out of your pocket when you want it. You play the music whenever you want it. You've got it right there. I think one of the the things we miss most clearly in the Christian life that Jesus offers to us is the true vine, this life he's offering. What we miss is we think of ourselves as an iPhone and not a CD player. We think that if we just plug in every once in a while, if we just get a little bit of a charge, get a little bit of a boost, then the life that we're supposed to live, the life that honors him, we can just do it on our own. And just charge up a little bit. And then when we sense our batteries are going low, we can just kind of plug back in. We can make it happen. But Jesus is telling you this morning, I know this may be bad news for some of you. You are CD player. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you are not plugged in, you will not play music. If you are not plugged in, you will not play music. Jesus tells us as the true vine, if you are not attached to me, no fruit will come. This is not a situation where you charge up on Sunday and then live your life during the week and come back and get another charge. No, Jesus says changed life, true life comes when you are connected to the life day by day, moment by moment through faith and the power of the spirit bearing fruit in your life. This is the life that Jesus has accomplished for you. Matthew Henry says it this way, true True Christians find by experience that any interruption in the exercise of their faith causes their holy affections to decline, their corruptions to revive, and their comforts to droop. Those who abide not in Christ, though they may flourish for a while in outward profession, yet come to nothing. Yet come to nothing. Jesus is clear That being one with the vine as a branch that wishes to bear fruit is an ongoing, day-by-day, vital, life-dependent connection. This is what it means when we say he is the vine and we are the branches. The vital connection, he is the power source that if we unplug at all will result in no fruit. Jesus is calling on those who desire to receive his life to be dependent on him day by day by day by day. Can I ask you, are you convinced this morning that you cannot be the father or the mother, the husband or the wife that God has called you to be unless you have been with Jesus? Are you convinced of it? Are you convinced this morning that you cannot be the employee or the boss, the supervisor that you want to be in the name of Jesus unless you have been with Jesus. Because what Jesus tells us is we can't unless we've been with him. It's through the power of the spirit alive in us that gives us the power we need to live a changed life that represents the true life that we have been invited into because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Are you dependent on Jesus this morning? As we get to the end of John 15, I believe there's one other way that Jesus distinguishes the life he offers from the life that we would find anywhere else, and that is that it is an eternal life. It's an eternal life. We see this in verses nine through 11. I want you to track track with me for just a moment. If Jesus has secured for us true life, through his past sacrifice on the cross and changed life in our present day relationship with him by the power of the spirit, then his words in verses nine through 11 are the future promise of eternal life experienced today, today for those who trust in him. 
You see, as Jesus is with his disciples and they're confused and they're anxious, he comforts them by reassuring them that his love is their love. That his record of perfect obedience is their record of perfect obedience. That his joy, the fullness of joy that he has known from all eternity is their joy. It's incredible what he says in verses 9 through 11. Look at those verses really quickly with me. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Here we see a pattern of eternal blessing. That love, obedience, and joy are first experienced by Jesus in relation to God. And then for any who trust in Jesus are experienced from Jesus in relationship with him. That the same thing that Jesus knows in the eternal blessing and approval and love and, and joy of the Father is made available to us. What does it mean? It means that in trusting our lives to Jesus, according to Jesus, we have access to the very origin of love itself. You see that? It means that according to Jesus, that we have claimed not just to his perfect record of obedience, but are invited into a life of obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. That in trusting in Jesus, according to Jesus, we get to experience his eternal, never-ending pleasure and joy in his son. God the Father in his son is given his joy, that joy, the eternal, lasting joy, it's offered to us. And these are qualities that aren't just distant promises, dreams of the future that one day we might be able to experience when we're in heaven with God. No, he says today, these are made available to us today through Jesus Christ. Jesus wants us to understand that the love and obedience and joy, the eternal life that we will one day know fully, we can taste even now and we can experience it by faith in him. But not only can we experience it, when we experience it, it changes the way that we live. Think about it. If you have experienced the eternal, never-ending love that motivated God to send his son to purchase you back. Imagine what that does to your love. Imagine when you see that love from God given through his son that Jesus would live a perfect life and give you his perfect record that changes the way you see the opportunity and the invitation to obey Jesus that joy that comes from all eternity past that could sustain the Savior through the death of the cross is made available to you. That changes your perspective on any suffering, on any trial, on any hardship you would walk through. You have the joy of the eternal relationship of God and his son. Can you imagine? Just dream with me for a moment. We're gonna, we're gonna dream a dream. Let's dream for a moment, okay? What if the church... What if Shades Mountain Baptist Church was so fueled and characterized by these eternal realities today that we loved hurting and lost people with the same depth of love that God does? Imagine. Can you imagine? If the church today, if Shades Mountain Baptist Church took so seriously what it meant to walk in holiness with God because of the love he has shown to us, that we were an example to the world of the good life that we can live in obedience to Jesus. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if, if the world looked into Shades Mountain Baptist Church and saw all of the same suffering and hardships that the brokenness of, of a sinful world brings about and yet people with joy and hope in the midst of those circumstances, can you imagine? Can you imagine? I'm convinced that the eternal life that Jesus offers to us today as followers of Christ is one of the most powerful witnesses of the gospel that the world could ever see. That the world could ever see. So do those eternal realities, do they actually affect your life today? Does the eternal love of God from on high, sending his son to save and redeem you, does it change the way you love? 
Does the fact that he would give you his perfect record that you would know what it means to walk in holiness, does that change the way you obey? Does the perfect joy from heaven all all eternity past found between God and Jesus, the joy of perfect communion, does that joy, knowing that you will one day stand in the presence of God, does that joy change the way you see your life, your circumstances? Does it change your perspective? Are you characterized by these eternal realities? When Jesus says, I'm the true vine, he's telling us about the life that he offers to us through his death and resurrection. True life that is lasting that brings satisfaction, fulfillment, joy. True life, changed life, the power to live the life God always designed for us to live. Eternal life now, experiencing the realities of the perfect relationship of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit together, we experience them now. What could be better than this life? What could be better than this life? I'm convinced that nothing, that nothing is better than knowing the true vine. Do you know the true vine? Are these the reality? This is what Jesus has purchased for you. This is the life, not just fire insurance. This is the life. Is it the life you know? As we close this morning, I want us to think just a little bit about where we've been over the last seven weeks. And I think there's a scene in Luke 9 that helps us to kind of frame where we've been as we looked at the I am statements of Jesus. In Luke 9, 18, we see that Jesus is praying alone and his disciples are kind of in the vicinity of where he is. And Jesus turns to them and he just kind of says out of nowhere, hey, who do the crowds say that I am? And the disciples are like, well, you know, they've thrown some different things out. They've tossed some different names out. They say you're Elijah, come again. They say that you're just like John the Baptist. They say that you're a prophet coming to reveal and say the things of God. But I think Jesus asked this question not to know what the crowds thought. I think Jesus knew what the crowds thought. Jesus posed this question so that he could ask the follow-up question. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? We've heard who Jesus says that he is. We've heard him say it. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. In every one of these statements, Jesus has made his claims known. We know unequivocally who he is and why he came. He didn't hide it. The question is, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? You know, the answer to that question is the most important answer you'll ever give. Because he tells you that if you believe in who he says he is, that you turn away from your sin and that you trust in his finished work through his life, death, and resurrection, that this life, that this life has been purchased for you. True life, changed life, eternal life. What could be better? Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? Let's pray together this morning. Father, we want to believe in who you are. God, so often in my own life, I find myself thinking the same words as the man in the gospels, God, who sought your help to heal his family. He said, I believe, help my unbelief. And God, we find that when we hear the eternal and lasting claims of your son Jesus in the book of John, when he says, I am, we know God, that we want with all we have to believe and yet so much of it is so hard to believe when we face our own sin, when we're working through the struggles in our own life, when the realities and the busyness and the, and the lists of life, they just, they just rage on and on and on and capture our attention. But in this moment, God, there's no escaping the question. Who do we say that you are? Because you have said to us that if we would put our faith in Jesus, we would know what it is to have true life, changed life, eternal life. So God, I pray that if you are at work 
in this place right now, we believe you are. God, I pray that you would show us where we have made your life less than what you have truly offered to us and that you would call us to the life that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus has made available in the true vine. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.